uh, the fate of the indigenous uh, population of the United States is a very clear example of how violence can succeed uh, from the moment that uh, crazed religious fanatics from England uh, landed in uh, what is now the United States and began slaughtering the Amalekites uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, from then on, as this spread through the continent, it just exterminated millions of people, and it succeeded. It's kind of interesting to see how that success is treated as well. There's no time for that. Uh, so yes, violence can succeed, but often at a tremendous cost, or violence can elicit more violence. Plenty of examples of that, too. Uh, examples I just gave, including the invasion of Iraq, are some, but they're much more important ones uh, right now, currently. Uh, so take this, this one is vastly more important. Uh, two months ago, uh, the, uh, Russia carried out its uh, largest military exercises in two decades. They displayed uh, new, more sophisticated weapons of mass destruction targeting the United States and Europe. Uh, and the Russian leaders made it clear that this was a direct response to Bush administration uh, uh, aggressiveness and militancy borrow Schlesinger's term, uh, exactly as had been predicted, incidentally. It was predicted right away that this was going to lead to a Russian response, and it has. Uh, one prime concern that the Russian generals expressed was uh, Washington's current development of what are called uh, low-yield nuclear weapons, popularly called bunker busters. Uh, the Russians can figure out, just as well as U.S. strategic analysts do, that these weapons are designed uh, to destroy uh, Russian command centers, which are hidden inside mountains, just like the American ones, uh, and could theoretically be destroyed by deep penetration, low yield uh, bunker busters. Uh, uh, that would destroy their uh, nuclear arsenal. Uh, Washington's insistence on using space for military purposes is again unilateral. Uh, with, this includes devastating first strike, is another major concern of Russian planners. Uh, uh, the, uh, and, uh, and they were acting as you'd expect, and was, as was predicted, by building up their offensive military capacity. Uh, U.S. Uh, analysts suspect that the Russians are now duplicating uh, the U.S. development of uh, hypersonic cruise vehicles. These, are, uh, these can orbit space. They can orbit in space at a low altitude right outside the Earth's atmosphere, and they can instantly penetrate the Earth's atmosphere, uh, uh, delivering a devastating attack uh, anywhere without any warning, and the Russians are probably duplicating it. Uh, U.S. analysts also estimate that Russian uh, military expenditures have approximately tripled in the Bush-Putin years. So, in fact, there may be some truth to uh, what Bush described as his gut reaction uh, when he met Putin for the first time, and he looked into his eyes and he saw that they were soulmates. Perhaps they are. Uh, the uh, Russians have also formally adopted uh, Bush's doctrine of so-called preemptive strike, meaning aggression at will. Uh, that's the revolutionary new doctrine of the national security strategy. They're also relying on automated response systems. In the past, we know that these have come literally within minutes of uh, launching a nuclear strike, barely aborted by uh, human intervention. By now, the systems have deteriorated with the collapse of the Russian economy under the market uh, fanaticism of the last 10 years. Well, we know a lot about the US systems. Uh, the US automated systems allow three minutes for human judgment uh, after computers warn of a missile attack. Uh, and that's uh, a daily occurrence. So every day there's a three minute period in which you discuss whether it'll allow the world to be blown up or not. Uh, uh, after that, you'll be happy to know comes a 30 second presidential press briefing after the three minutes. Uh, the Pentagon has also found uh, very serious design flaws in uh, the computer systems, computer security systems. This will surprise absolutely no one who has any acquaintance with compl complicated uh, software and uh, computers. In fact, for that matter, anybody has a computer. 
So it's known that there are going to be design flaws, and they've found them. Uh, the, uh, but this is a lot worse than your hard disk crashing. Uh, uh, they uh, uh, have also discovered that uh, errors in the computer security systems could allow terrorist hackers to break in and simulate a launch. Uh, that's called an accident waiting to happen by U.S. strategic analysts. Uh, and the Russian systems are far less reliable. Well, the dangers are very severe, uh, and they're being consciously escalated by the threat and use of violence. And here we're talking about real threats to survival of the species. This is not thousands of people being killed. Uh, but they're being consciously escalated uh, because uh, of the priorities, which are rational in their own terms. Uh, right now, the, uh, uh, the U.S. is deploying what's called a missile defense system uh, in Alaska. The, uh, it's, it's, being, it's coming under criticism. Uh, the criticism is that it's obviously a political gesture time for the election and that it's using uh, untested technology, which probably won't work, uh, at an immense cost. Uh, all of that may be correct, but there's a much more fundamental criticism. Uh, the fundamental criticism is that it might work or it might look as though it's going to work uh, and opponents have to make a worst case analysis. Uh, so if it looks as if it might work, they are going to have to take countermeasures, and the countermeasures will be massively building up means to overwhelm it. Uh, you have to understand that, that the Chinese and the Russians understand just as well as U.S. analysts who are open about it that missile defense is a first strike weapon. It's uh, what they call a sword, not a shield. It expands the domain of freedom of aggression, including first strike. And, and that's the way the U.S. has reacted in the past. They recently declassified uh, records about the U.S. reaction to uh, Russia's uh, deployment of a very small, limited ABM system around Moscow in 1968. And as you'd predict, the U.S. responded to that by targeting it with nuclear weapons, uh, targeting the outlying radar, radar sites with nuclear weapons, this is a much more serious system, and the reaction will be even more extreme, especially for the Chinese. Uh, China has a very limited deterrent, a couple dozen missiles, uh, and this would, if it even looks like it's going to work, will eliminate the credibility of that, so they're going to have to massively expand it. Well, if China expands its offensive military capacity, uh, India is going to react to that and Pakistan will respond to India's doing it, and you get a ripple effect that goes on, uh, vastly increasing the threat to all of us. Uh, that particular part is discussed and is indeed dangerous. Uh, what is not discussed, however, uh, is the uh, threat from West Asia. Uh, now, it is discussed internally. So the US Strategic Command, the top planning agency for nuclear weapons, uh, it's uh, former head General Lee Butler, uh, describes uh, Israel's weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction, uh, he describes it as dangerous in the extreme, uh, both of because of the threat that it poses and because it incites uh, proliferation in response. Uh, actually, the Bush administration is now enhancing that threat. Uh, Israel already has uh, uh, its air force is larger and technologically more advanced than any NATO power other than the U.S., according to its own estimate. It's not because Israel's so powerful. It's because it's an offshore U.S. military base, in effect. So their air force is already more powerful than, say, Britain's uh, or any other NATO power. Uh, and the United States is now sending them uh, over 100 of uh, the most advanced uh, jet bombers, uh, F-16Is, uh, with the announcement uh, that they can, among their, that their capability, they, they're capable of flying to Iran and back. Uh, they also announced that uh, these are updated versions of the F-16s that uh, Israel used to uh, bomb the Iraqi nuclear reactor, the Osirak reactor, in 1981. Uh, there's a kind of a story about that, that uh, the Israeli bombing deterred Saddam's nuclear weapons program. It was known right away that that's not true. Uh, the Osirak reactor was inspected by the head of uh, Harvard's uh, physics department immediately. He's a nuclear 
a power specialist, and he reported in Nature, the world's main science journal, that it's just not designed for nuclear weapons. Uh, however, we now know from defectors and other evidence that it did initiate Iraq's nuclear weapons program, another indication of the standard cycle of violence inducing violence. Uh, well, uh, uh, the Israeli press, uh, in their Hebrew versions, they don't translate this into English, uh, adds that uh, the United States is now providing the Israeli Air Force with what they call special weapons. Okay, we can guess what they are. Uh, but you can figure out what Iranian intelligence assumes. This is all aimed at Iranian intelligence, who of course read this material. Uh, they are going to have to make a worst case analysis. You can figure it out, I don't bother telling you. Uh, perhaps the purpose is to incite some Iranian action that will be a pretext for an attack. Uh, perhaps it's just to rattle the leadership and to contribute to uh, internal conflict or chaos, but whatever it is, uh, it's obviously seriously increasing threats, which at this level are become threats to survival. Well, the collapse of the pretexts for invading Iraq are quite familiar, uh, but not enough attention has been paid, I think, uh, to the most important consequence of the collapse of the pretexts of Blair and Bush and others. Uh, the original pretext was that uh, uh, the, the U.S. has the right to attack a country if it has uh, links to terror and is developing weapons of mass destruction. Okay, can't say that anymore. Uh, and there's a new doctrine that has been uh, proposed which increases, uh, expands the right of aggression. The links to terror have been dropped and it is now no longer necessary for a country to have weapons of mass destruction or even programs for developing but to have, uh, I'm quoting the official story from Colin Powell and others, uh, it's enough that the country have the intent and ability to develop weapons of mass destruction. Okay, who has the ability? Uh, any country that has a high school chemistry and biology lab has the ability to develop weapons of mass destruction. Uh, who has the intent? Well, whatever Tony Blair and Jack Straw and um, their American associates say. Uh, what that, to translate that into simple language, it means anybody is subject to attack, instant, devastating, unwarned attack at any moment uh, if they just disobey orders. That's the new doctrine, far more expansive than the old one. Uh, and new military programs are being developed uh, to uh, uh, enhance the capacity to carry this out. Actually, an extremely important one was announced immediately after the National Security Strategy was released in September 2002. Uh, plans were announced right away to sh with regard to militarization of space uh, to shift from the Clinton Doctrine. The Clinton Doctrine was that the U.S. must control space to shift from that to a new doctrine, from control of space to what's called ownership of space. Uh, ownership of space means instant engagement anywhere in the world from space, putting the, any part of the world at risk of instant destruction thanks to sophisticated uh, surveillance systems and lethal weaponry that's going to be placed in space which we're not going to own. Uh, well, that's quite in accord with the national security strategy. Control isn't enough. You have to go on to ownership. Uh, well, the world's intelligence agencies can read the uh, the Air Force Space Command Strategic Master Plan, from which I've just been quoting uh, as easily as I can or more easily, and they'll draw the natural conclusions. You can figure out what they will be. Uh, that increases the risk to all of us, a very severe risk. Uh, the collapse of the pretexts uh, did lead to a new doctrine. Actually, it's not called a doctrine, it's called a vision. Uh, actually, it's called a messianic vision by the elite U.S. press. Turns out that the war in Iraq was inspired by the president's messianic vision to bring democracy to Iraq and to the whole region. And the president affirmed the vision in a presidential address last November. Uh, well, it was interesting to see the reaction. I read as much as I could about it in England, too, but mostly the U.S.
Uh, the reaction ranged from, at one end, uh, just rapturous awe. The uh, leading veteran correspondent of the Washington Post, the former editor of the International Herald Tribune, uh, concluded uh, breathlessly that that shows that the Iraq invasion was the noblest war in history because it was inspired by a messianic vision. Uh, there were those who uh, criticized the doctrine, the, the vision, uh, namely that it's uh, uh, beyond our means. It's generous and noble, but beyond our means, the beneficiaries aren't worth it. Uh, they're too backward. Uh, others may not share our nobility and altruism and such problems. Uh, that this is the motive for the invasion is presupposed, isn't even discussed. It's just presupposed in news reporting and commentary, and then you're either critical or in awe. Uh, the uh, few, uh, as a research project, you might look for the evidence that this is the reason. Uh, it turns out that the evidence reduces to one fact. Our leader announced it. Therefore, it is true, period. Uh, North Korea couldn't do better. Uh, just check that out and see if it's true. Also, to accept that this is the motive requires suppressing your knowledge uh, that if that's the motive, uh, Bush and Blair must be among the most astounding liars in history because when they mobilized the world for war, tried to, there was a single question. Uh, does, is Iraq going to live up to getting rid of its weapons of mass destruction? Right, it turns out they're now saying that was a total lie. Uh, the real reason was our messianic vision, uh, and we're supposed to accept that as gospel truth and sort of forget the fact that the people who are telling it to us are also telling us they're among the most extreme liars ever. But a uh, properly educated intellectual class is quite capable of this. You can check for yourself. Uh, I've yet to find, uh, I, I have not found an exception with considerable search, except way out on the margins. Actually, there is one exception, one glaring exception. Uh, a few days after the president revealed his vision, uh, the Washington Post published the results of a US-run poll in Baghdad, the one I mentioned before. Uh, people were asked why they thought the US invaded Iraq, and there were some who agreed with roughly 100% of articulate Western opinion, uh, namely that the goal is to bring democracy to Iraq. In Baghdad, uh, 1% agree with that. 5% uh, thought that the goal was to uh, help Iraqis. This is last October, you know, not way before all of the latest revelations. Uh, and the rest said the obvious, what I already mentioned, the view that's the idea that's inexpressible in the West. Well, Iraqis don't have to know American history to understand what the noble vision means. Uh, we can look at that history and find it out, but they don't have to. Uh, they know their own history. That's enough. Uh, so, for example, they know that uh, England created Iraq, modern Iraq, uh, drew its borders, and created it so that uh, uh, England, not Turkey, would get control of the oil in the northern area, and also that Iraq would have to be independent because it would have no access to the sea. That's why the Principality of Kuwait was carved out. Uh, so that's the way it was created. They know that uh, England also had noble visions, messianic visions. Uh, Iraq was independent, had a constitution, you know, parliament, all sorts of nice things. Uh, meanwhile, the British Foreign Office and Lord Curzon uh, were carrying out their own plans, uh, which were declassified, released uh, 60 years later. England's much slower than the United States. Uh, but they're there, uh, and it turns out that they were doing what you'd expect. Uh, their plan was to, that Iraq and other countries of the region uh, should be what they called an Arab facade, uh, that Britain would rule uh, behind various constitutional fictions. Actually, that uh, uh, conception was just reported uh, two or three days ago by a senior British official uh, who said that uh, after the turnover of sovereignty to Iraq, on June 30th, Iraq will have full sovereignty, but in practice, it won't exercise it fully. You know, that's familiar, Arab facade that we rule behind various constitutional fictions. And uh, Iraqis didn't need the British Foreign 
office records to know this. They know it from their own experience, like the people at the wrong end of the clubs, typically. And furthermore, they can see what is now happening right in front of their eyes. So the United States is uh, building the world's biggest embassy in Baghdad, uh, sensitively using one of uh, Saddam's main royal main palaces to house it. Uh, the uh, head of the embassy, the new ambassador, is John Negroponte. Uh, when he was appointed, the Wall Street Journal had a good article about him in which it said he called him a modern proconsul. Uh, and he said that uh, uh, Wolfowitz uh, learned his uh, trade as a proconsul uh, under the, during the Reaganite phase of the current administration in Washington when he was ambassador to Honduras presiding over the second largest embassy in Latin America and the biggest CIA station in the world. Uh, not because Honduras is such a center of world power, but because his responsibility as proconsul, which is what he was called in Honduras, his responsibility was to supervise the military bases from which the US mercenary army was carrying out a a, mur a destructive, murderous terrorist war against Nicaragua to stop another effort at successful defiance. Practically destroyed the country, uh, but it's regarded as a grand success uh, because now they no more successful defiance. That was his job in Honduras. Uh, so he learned his trade as a proconsul. Uh, that led to the United States being brought to the world court, uh, uh, condemned by the world court for international terrorism, ordered to terminate the crime after which the current incumbents in Washington, including the moderate Colin Powell, escalated the crime. Uh, they were ordered to pay retribution, um, reparations, huge reparations. You know what happened to that. Uh, when the U.S. refused, uh, uh, Nicaragua took it to the Security Council. Uh, there were two resolutions in which the Security Council uh, 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 supported the, restated and supported the world court judgment and called on all states to observe international law. Uh, they were vetoed by the United States with Britain politely abstaining uh, and they're out of history uh, because they say the wrong thing like terror against other people. Uh, well, that's uh, Negroponte's history uh, and uh, He's perfectly qualified to uh, run the world's biggest embassy in the world uh, in Iraq in order to transfer sovereignty to Iraqis, we're told. Okay, you can decide whether you want to believe that. Uh, Iraqis uh, can also see, as we all can if we want, that the U.S. is insisting on keeping uh, military bases and military forces essentially permanently. And as Paul Wolfowitz puts it, uh, only a stable, prolonged U.S. troop presence and a weak Iraqi army uh, will, be, will allow us to nurture democracy in Iraq. Okay, you can decide what you think about that. Uh, Wolfowitz, incidentally, is called the idealist in chief of the Bush administration, the visionary leading the crusade for democracy. If there were time, there isn't, I'd run through his record which is intriguing. Uh, there's rarely, you rarely find anyone with a record of such visceral hatred of democracy and support for tyranny shown in case after case, but we'll put that aside. Uh, the, uh, it doesn't matter for the messianic vision uh, that uh, Iraqis overwhelmingly want Iraqis to be in, in uh, charge of security. Uh, not all, again. So 7% of Iraqis want U.S. forces to be in charge 5% uh, want the uh, U.S. appointed governing council to be in charge. These are British-run polls last October again. Uh, now, of course, it's much worse. Uh, but it just doesn't matter. Uh, uh, six months ago, not now, 80% uh, of Iraqis said they had no confidence in U.S. U.K. forces or in the civilian authorities. Now, of course, much worse. Uh, but none of this has uh, any relevance to the uh, uh, messianic vision. Uh, well, Iraqis can also observe the economic measures that are being imposed by the current proconsul, Paul Bremer, answerable to the Pentagon. Uh, he, they, in effect, open up the Iraqi economy uh, and banking system uh, 
to effective uh, U.S. takeover. Uh, Britain will get a few crumbs in honor of its uh, cooperation. Uh, the plans were immediately denounced by uh, Iraqi business leaders who pointed out that they would be destroyed. Uh, Bremer also imposed a 15% top flat tax, which makes Iraq, will make Iraq one of the least taxed countries in the world, uh, completely unable to rebuild the devastated infrastructure from the US-British sanctions and the wars, and to carry out badly needed uh, social spending. That's all gone. Uh, Iraqi businesses don't like it, uh, but there should be fewer problems with Iraqi workers. Uh, the, uh, Iraq does have a militant active labor tradition, despite all the repression. Uh, but the occupying army, as soon as they moved in, uh, took immediate action to destroy the unions, uh, broke into uh, union offices, arrested the leaders, uh, blocked strikes by force, uh, enforced uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, brutal uh, anti-labor laws, and, ha and handed over concessions to uh, uh, bitterly anti-union uh, U.S. businesses. Uh, these economic proposals, incidentally, are completely familiar. Uh, those are the kind that created the third world. The third world was compelled by force to accept market discipline. Uh, the rich countries, England, the United States, Germany, up to Japan and East Asia, the ones that developed, they just, you know, they may teach the rules of those uh, principles in graduate economics courses, but they didn't observe them. Uh, they relied on a powerful, uh, powerful state intervention to drive the economy and protect it. And those are the ones that grew and developed. Uh, the ones that had the principles imposed on them by force are what we now call the third world. So there's nothing unfamiliar about the proposals being made for Iraq. Uh, well, it's an open question whether Iraqis can be coerced uh, into submitting to the uh, nominal sovereignty that's offered under various constitutional fictions uh, designed by the occupying power to block true sovereignty. Uh, it's been astonishing to see their resistance to this. I don't mean bombs and guns, I just, which are the least of it, just the steadfast refusal to accept the demands of the occupying powers. That has been extremely impressive, and it's forced them to back down. Uh, that's one question. Uh, for privileged uh, people in the West, people like us, uh, there's a far more important question, and that is uh, whether we will permit uh, uh, our own governments to uh, nurture democracy in the style of uh, idealist in chief uh, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, as in their traditional domains, in fact, for a long time. Well, right at this point, uh, crucial questions arise uh, about the nature of Western democracies and their future. Now, these are extremely important topics. They're obviously the most important ones for us. And they're important for everyone because uh, it's quite literally true that the survival of the species is at stake and the answers to these questions. But those are for some other time. Thank you. the honest truth, I, um, I doubt very much that George Bush has much to do with policy formation. I mean, the way the, the presidency is more or less like um, royalty in the United States. So the Queen of England opens Parliament with a speech, right? But nobody asks whether she believes it, you know, or whether she understands it. Uh, her role is to, it's a ceremonial role. You present, uh, uh, it's a role that's connected with unity of the people, uh, patriotism, obedience, and so on and so forth. Uh, the content is something else. Uh, that's by people who run the country. Uh, the people who run the country are those in political office, but much more importantly, they're associates in the concentrations of private economic power. 
Uh, that's where the country is really run. And that shouldn't be a big secret either. Uh, America's leading social philosopher, John Dewey, uh, who's right, very mainstream American, uh, he pointed out uh, once that as long as um, we have what he called industrial feudalism uh, rather than industrial democracy, that means tyrannical totalitarian institutions uh, running the economy, command economies basically, as long as that's instead of industrial democracy like workers control and management, uh, as long as we have that, then politics will be the shadow cast by business over society. And that's approximately accurate. Now, it's not that the state has no independent choices, it does, but uh, an amalgam. Uh, exactly the role that George Bush plays in this is very dubious, questionable. Uh, in some cases, like say Ronald Reagan, uh, he probably didn't even know what the policies were. Uh, he was reading off his note cards or the teleprompter or something like that. Uh, and Bush may have some knowledge of them, but I think he's mostly a symbolic, a ceremonial figure, trained to act in certain ways and so on. So if I had a minute with him, I would say, you know, uh, have you talked to God lately or something like that? <laughs> Dan Rigby, a two-part question. Uh, if John Kerry wins the presidency, will it make any difference in Iraq? And should Ralph Nader still stand? Uh, if Kerry wins, which I think is unlikely, just looking at the relative uh, funding of the two candidates, and elections are mostly bought, uh, it, uh, but suppose he does. I doubt if it would make much of a difference in Iraq. Um, their policies, I mean, it's very hard to know what Kerry's policies are. He's been very careful not to, his advi again, his advisors have been very careful not to formulate them. But chances are it would be more like Albright and Clinton. That is, same policies, but not so uh, stupidly and arrogantly formulated and implemented, which is a difference. And you know, in a huge system of power like the United States, those small differences can translate into large outcomes. Uh, the major difference between the two, I think, would be domestic. The Bush administration are real extremists. I mean, it's, it's a narrow political spectrum, but they're way out of an extreme. I mean, they want to simply, and they're pretty brazen and open about it again, they want to dismantle uh, everything that has been achieved by popular struggle over the last century. Uh, everything from the limited measures of uh, social welfare, you know, support systems, pensions, uh, minimal medical care, uh, uh, to progressive taxation, in fact, any, about anything you can think of. I mean, they want to create a real utopia for the masters. Uh, a very powerful state, they're not conservatives, a very powerful state which serves the rich and powerful and somehow controls everybody else one or another means. I mean, there is a kind of a quasi-fascist uh, strain there. I don't like to use the term, but it's there. Uh, and uh, except that the fascists did develop welfare systems, and they want to destroy those. Uh, and the uh, Kerry will be less extreme in this respect, just as Clinton was less extreme. Uh, and those make big differences, too. Like, you know, you have a disabled mother you have to take care of. It makes a difference how extreme the uh, policies are. Uh, uh, those differences, I think, are significant. That gets to the Nader question. Uh, my feeling is that uh, it's, it, it should be a very high priority to keep uh, Wolfowitz, uh, Rumsfeld, those characters, uh, prevent them from getting another mandate. Uh, if they do, they can be extremely dangerous uh, in every respect. The, uh, you know, the difference between militarizing space under the conception of control and militarizing it under the conception of ownership uh, may be the difference between survival of the species and non-survival. I mean, neither is very attractive, uh, but there are differences. And the same is true on the domestic front and to a limited extent elsewhere. So I do think it's a priority. Uh, Nader doesn't. I mean, I like him, you know, known him for a long time. I like what he stands for and does, uh, but I really think he's making a mistake. Uh, actually, what he ought to do, in my opinion, uh, and actually, th this has been, uh, there are things he could do to be in the campaign and not affect the outcome. 
uh, there's some technical things he could do. Actually, one of them was uh, proposed by a well-known constitutional uh, law professor at uh, uh, Yale University, Bruce Anderson, and, and it's an interesting suggestion. Uh, in the U.S. Elect the system, you don't elect people, you elect electors, okay? and the electors elect the people. The, the candidates. I mean, that was part of the original Madisonian system to try to marginalize the public and keep power in the hands of the wealthy. Uh, now it doesn't have quite that function, but the system is still there, which means that Nader could, if he wanted to, uh, run but uh, select the Democratic electors. That would mean you're voting for Nader, but the elector is Kerry's. Okay, so that's a way to run and use the opportunity to say whatever you want and bring issues up and so on and so forth, but not affect the election. I mean, that's one way to do it, and there are other ways. And my, my opinion is that's what he ought to do. It's fine to bring up issues and discuss things and so on and so forth, uh, but to act, uh, to, to act so as to bring back into office the people around Bush, which is exactly what it is, uh, that's just not sensible in my opinion. Yeah, Ron Senchak, uh, former U.S. Navy from uh, Newark, New Jersey, uh, first became political in, in the Vietnam War, went in, saluted the flag, and came out burning it. Uh, and I've been very active in Manchester in the Stop the War Coalition. There were 20,000 people on the streets, and we're still going strong here. But I did want to ask you the difference, differences that you might see between the anti-war movement uh, in the 60s and the early 70s and the anti-war movement now. I think it's, it's much more, I'm optimistic. People around the world are talking about a different world now, much more than they were before, and I'm optimistic. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, in the 1960s, we kind of forget, but the anti-war movement didn't exist uh, f for years after the war in Vietnam began. It literally didn't exist. I mean, there was so little opposition to Kennedy's uh, attack on South Vietnam that nobody even remembers that it took place. I mean, you have to study to find out it took place, but it did. In 1962, uh, Kennedy sent the U.S. Air Force to start bombing South Vietnam, uh, initiated uh, chemical warfare uh, in South Vietnam, which has an estimated 600,000 victims, not small, uh, started rounding up people, programs to round up uh, ultimately millions of people in what amounted to concentration camps, uh, and that then just escalated, and there was no protest at all. You know, I mean, no American president could even dream of doing that today, and that's because of the activism that developed later in the 60s, and even more so in the 70s and 80s and 90s, which has just changed the country. Uh, changed consciousness enormously. I mean, finally, an anti-war movement did develop in the United States, and in, uh, same in Britain, I should say. Uh, anti-war act activism here was extremely low in the 60s, virtually non-existent. I remember very well, because I was flown over by leaders of the anti-war movement here through the 60s, because they needed somebody to give a talk. You know? uh, but, and uh, this went on for a long time. Uh, by the late 60s, it had developed, it had become big, but kind of narrow. It expanded enormously afterwards. I mean, the major popular movements that one thinks of as movements of the 60s, uh, the main ones that really influenced the society and changed it are not from the 60s. They're from the 70s and the 80s. Uh, so take, say, the women's movement. That barely existed in the 60s. I mean, it really took off in the 70s. It's had an enormous effect on the whole society. Uh, the environmental movement didn't exist in the 60s, it came later. Uh, the anti-nuclear movements, the solidarity movements are mostly in the 80s, and they're by now huge. Well, you get back to this war. Uh, this war is uh, unique in the history of Europe, hundreds of years, European imperialism, including the United States. It's the first time in European history or American history that there was massive protest against a war before it was launched. I can't think of any historical example of that. Uh, where there was any protest against the war before it was launched, let alone massive protest. Well, that's a, an indication of very big changes in popular understanding and consciousness. And uh, it, you can be certain that people in power know it. Uh, here are other things that aren't told you 
told you very often, but you can find them if you want. Uh, the Pentagon Papers were very interesting and unusual in that it was not declassified, it was stolen. So it's like getting the archives of a conquered country, you know, where they don't have a chance to uh, purify them. Uh, so the Pentagon Papers are rather revealing. Uh, the Pentagon Papers run from the late 40s to um, 1968, the end in 1968. Uh, the last part of the Pentagon Papers is right after the Tet Offensive. The Tet Offensive in January 1968 convinced American business elites that the war isn't worth it. They've already won, they've already destroyed South Vietnam, there isn't going to be any successful defiance or any uh, effect on others. So it's just a waste of money and time. And they essentially ordered the government, ordered Lyndon Johnson to call the war off. He was informed not to run for office, stop the bombing of North Vietnam, enter into negotiations, and he obediently followed the orders. Uh, but after the uh, Tet Offensive, right afterwards, uh, Johnson did want to send 200,000 more troops to South Vietnam. Uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff objected and the reasons they objected, which are described in the last pages of the Pentagon Papers, is that they said they would, if they uh, continued the war, they would need those troops in the United States for civil disorder control, uh, because they would not be able to control constituencies that were out of control. And they mentioned them, young people, women, minorities, others. They're just not going to control them. So they're going to need the troops right in the United States, and they refused to send them. Uh, well, that's uh, important. There was already a record. By that time, the military, top military, wanted the army out. They were trying to get the army out of Vietnam. Uh, remember then, it was a civilian army. It was not a professional army. It's one of the reasons they shifted to a professional army, which is kind of like a mercenary army of the disadvantaged, is what it comes out to. Uh, the United States made a bad mistake in Vietnam. It's the first time an imperial power tried to fight a colonial war with a citizen's army. Now, that doesn't work. Now, that's why the British used Gurkhas and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Indians in Afghanistan and stuff like that. That's why the French have a foreign legion. I mean, every sensible imperial power uh, uses mercenaries, usually local mercenaries from one part of the country moving to another and that sort of thing. But the U.S. tried to carry out a straight, traditional imperial war of destruction with a citizen's army. And civilians just aren't, they can't do that, you know. I mean, sometimes they go off to extreme barbarism, but they just can't uh, deal with this kind of situation. You really need professional killers for that, like the French Foreign Legion. I mean, they can do it. Uh, uh, and, and in fact, uh, civilians are also too integrated with the home society. So what's going on in, say, the youth culture in the United States in the late 60s it was affecting the soldiers. I was getting to the point where soldiers were killing their officers, they were going off on drugs. And this, uh, the army really thought the army's going to disintegrate and they want them out. Uh, well, that's another change. Uh, in uh, 1980, when, when any president comes into office, first thing he does is uh, call for an, uh, an intelligence analysis of the world situation obviously. Uh, usually we don't find out about it for 30 or 40 years until it gets declassified. Uh, but in 1989, when Bush number one came in, uh, somebody in the Pentagon leaked a piece of it, or in the CIA, a small piece of it was leaked and barely published. I mean, it's there, but if you find it, it was interesting. Uh, it had to do with uh, military intervention. Uh, specifically, it had to do with what they called uh, wars against much weaker enemies. 